Welcome back to Inside Chips, the podcast that keeps you up to speed on the fast-moving world of the semiconductor industry. I'm your host, Gregory Haley, coming to you this week from ITF World, IMEX premier event where industry leaders shared their plans for semiconductor technology development. This week, IMEX introduced CMOS 2.0, reshaping chip design by stacking transistors vertically and integrating backside power delivery. NVIDIA highlighted incredible growth in GPU computing power, but warned of rapidly increasing energy demands. Micron announced advances in high bandwidth memory, notably integrating logic directly into memory chips for improved performance. And healthcare took center stage with iMac unveiling partnerships with MIT for personalized medicine diagnostics and Merck for advanced preclinical drug discovery platforms. iMac also showcased an innovative ingestible sensor for gut health diagnostics. It's a lot of news, and I had the opportunity to sit for an interview with Joe DeBeck, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at iMac, who shared his insights on these new developments. What do you see as the most important message coming out of ITF World this year? Well, as it is annually, and, and that will focus on this year, is that the, uh, the interaction and the collaboration is, is going to be so essential for making the moves from the AI-driven era, that is the headline of the conference, to bringing and bridging to t technology development. And so I think that's, uh, that's what you see on stage as well. Right? So again, from the molecules down mm -hmm. up to the, uh, the new way of doing AI beyond ChatGPT. So I think that's the main theme. Mm -hmm. um, it has been, uh, you know, structured I think quite well in the presentations that indeed each of these layers um, circuit design as well you know like in the middle um, up into the applications is uh, needs to talk to each other system technology co-optimization we would call it. Do you see AI especially in terms of chip design and manufacturing design playing a bigger role continuing to grow in its influence? I think there was a, actually indeed a wake-up uh, call or at least an awakening to of, of all of the industry to to see that the workflows that we carry today from um, how things are done in the fab, how materials are being discovered, all the way up to um, yeah, how do you design a chip, how do you design a circuit, how to partition it, uh, even to the workflow of uh, actual AI itself, right? There's a lot of uh, innovation still needed there. So AI is going to be a, a co-engineer, I think, as uh, has been mentioned on stage uh, by, by some, and at least assisting uh, from research up to, to, of course, the applications, but indeed very, very close to our daily practice, as a matter of fact. IMAC is known for tackling the what's next in this industry. Uh, what are some of the emerging technologies or research areas that you think could shape the industry in the next five to ten years? Of course, we've talked about AI already. Are there other areas that uh, you see developing or having an impact on uh, semiconductor manufacturing? Yeah, there's uh, of course AI is overarching. So let's focus on, on some of the more detailed uh, mm -hmm. steps there. And as our, um, our CEO presented in his opening statement, CMOS 2.0 is a bit of a concept that we carry internally where we do see, uh, you know, it, the roadmap being furthered, right? So, I mean, there, there is, of course, dimensional scaling, which is harder. The third dimension is coming in. The question is, how do you partition? How do you make supercells? And how do you make your whole system programmable? This will require technology innovation uh, in, say, the, the framework we know today. Beyond that framework, some of our colleagues presented the, you know, the, the, the frontiers and the dragons at the end, you know, of the, of the map. Um, but there's a lot of things going on. Oscar Painter showed the, uh, the, the quantum computing challenges, as a matter of fact. Um, we have neuromorphic, we have uh, different paradigms of computing coming in, where again, new, new devices, new technology will be the, the key to develop them. So I think in that era of, of, area of uh, technology development, we're by far not at the end of the creativity. The question is, how do you develop those in a way that it will actually feed into the applications? Better said, what is the, the workload that the, you will um, you will find to be helped most by these new different paradigms. And so that is the, the, the interest that we see at IMEC as well internally, investing quite a bit in that workload understanding and then bringing the, uh, the different or the diverse features that are required there down into the, the, the most or best or most efficient uh, technology. Yeah, yeah that, that brings up a couple of key points. Um, of course, system scaling being a, a big part of the conversation, but also sustainability. Mm -hmm. How is IMAX sort of positioning itself to balance those competing demands? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, of course, we as an industry have always been driven by lowering the energy consumption of our devices. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here with our smartphones and etc. Uh, et 
that's of course a, a bit of the standard practice. Let's let's move deeper into the discussion of sustainability we had on the forum or the panel uh, on stage. It really goes from materials development or replacement, uh, PFAS, and, and those uh, difficult areas to tackle, mm -hmm. to um, how do you develop these new materials? Maybe indeed you use AI rather than experimentation or waste of chemicals before you really go in. And so model first and experiment then is, is uh, of course, you know, growing fast. And that's where compute will help us in a, in a way. Of course, we also need to do that in a, in a sensible manner. But then throughout the manufacturing itself, so our uh, SSTS program is also in using our fab as a laboratory to, to enable experiments or uh, new insights into how sustainability can become part of the manufacturing chain itself. And then of course at the, at the use case itself, you know, more efficient compute rather than using the brute force that's potentially developed for certain application into another where it also works, but then it burns too much energy. All of that needs to really be uh, be reconsidered. And then maybe, and that's something that's hard to put on stage, but the consumer needs to know what she or he is using in terms of, of, uh, of um, yeah, resources for the apps and the applications in general that, that we are so keen on using today. Yeah, that's a good point, the consumer's uh, relationship to what's happening. One of the uh, key areas, as we see fabs developing in some places, for example, in uh, Southwest United States, uh, there was a recent recent announcement about developing fabs in the Middle East is water, mm -hmm. right? Access to water, uh, consumption of water, and as the fabs get bigger and more complex, and the processes get hotter, we're going to continue to see this with water consumption increase. Is there uh, a plan or uh, a strategy around? Uh, resolving some of the water issues? Water was the first thing we looked at also in our own facility. Yeah? So reduction and reuse um, are essential there. Mm -hmm. um, not being the engineer per se on the FAP, I wouldn't be able to quote the specific numbers, but we are, as, as a matter of fact, also in conjunction with our Spanish, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the Spanish government in Andalusia and, and in uh, central government uh, building a FAP in Malaga. So we also there are looking at the constraints that are uh, actually they're omnipresent even here in the lowlands uh, sure. where rain is sort of part of our uh, DNA. We have droughts that uh, that could, uh, you know, that really put a, a constraint on, on uh, consumption. So in general terms, I, I of course, uh, completely concede what you're saying. Um, in order to have real solutions, let's let's use, again, common industry uh, insights to, to make it happen fast because reuse of water is going to be essential. There cannot be waste of water. Good point. Uh, collaboration and work across companies has been a big part of the theme of the conversations mm -hmm. that we've had this week. Can, can you think of an example or a partnership uh, or ecosystem approach that's been showcased here that uh, stands out? Oh, yeah. Um, maybe there's, there's too many to, uh, to mention. Uh, most of the people on stage are exactly partners. I mean, one of the longest lived ones, of course, is with the, uh, with the ecosystem of uh, equipment suppliers and material suppliers. And of course, amplif or, or exemplified by the long standing relationship with ASML, but also other uh, equipment vendors and, uh, and on the material side, uh, a lot of collaborations go, go way back. I think the strength of collaboration now we see also growing the ones in, in, in those areas where you find companies that are not necessarily producing the chips. There are more in design or even at the system level. And again, it, it refers to the, to the earlier made comment that they need to, so, to see where this technology is diversifying or potentially can be diversified for their, their specific applications. One I would pick up then if you ask me to, to zoom into one is automotive. It's been on stage indeed, eh? so Valeo uh, uh, executive was talking about the collaboration we have. We set up shop also in Germany, which is of course uh, the, the cradle of much of what's happening in automotive in Europe, um, to see whether we can you know, look at the, the new frontier of the engine of the car, which evidently is going to be a computer, um, how to you know, make sure that there's flexibility, there is uh, foresight in how to build these systems, how to work on sensor fusion. Um, and so that collaboration, I would say, I, you know, I bring it to the front because I hope it's going to be really successful because it will need innovation uh, very soon uh, to demonstrate that uh, also in Europe, you know, we can build this type of compute that will then fan out in other applications like robotics and, and, uh, and unmanned vehicles in, in more general terms. Yeah, I think automotive is a good example because, you know, here's a 
here's a technology in an industry that has been, you know, traditionally very manufacturing oriented and, and mechanical oriented, but is converging very quickly with what's happening in the semiconductor industry as cars become smarter and, and there's uh, energy control systems and all of these systems now that require more and more chips. So I can see automotive being a big uh, partnership happening with what's happening in semiconductor research as well. Yeah, totally correct. And and uh, just to build on that, just for one more sentence, it, it's converging, but also challenged by, right? I mean, think right. the OEMs that have not been ingrained in silicon are now really finding their ways to get both the design of the, of the chips, or at least the architecture of the system, uh, being compliant with their roadmaps on how to sensor and sensor fusion is, is in their plans. and and. How actually the, the the emotion around the car within the cabin and also you know the the, the vehicle itself and how it behaves is uh, is being managed by this this compute. So yeah, it's it's an an exciting area to move. It needs to move fast, and it's something that's happening in the U.S. as well. You know, see sure. we have collaboration in Michigan because there, of course, again, this is going to be this beating heart of that right uh, of that sector uh, as collaborations with Japan because we need to get standards in, and then the chiplet technology, by the way, is going to be an interesting. A uh, new paradigm for for making those things happen. With the with the growth in AI, do you anticipate an increase in custom silicon? Do you see that growing more uh, for very specific applications, even more so than it has been in the past? Yeah, well, there there will be custom silicon on on say the non-compute area, of course. You know, sensors, imagers, etc. We see a lot of that happening. Also specific for certain applications, like in automotive, like in defense, like in uh, health. Of course, when it comes to compute, typically um, the, the, the burden of the costs is there. And in order to design a really complex chip, you need, you know, yeah, it's it's for uh, the not faint at heart, so to speak, and also you need the resources. But of course, with the advent of AI, a lot of that may become cheaper because a lot of the, um, say, engineering will also be supported by a lot of AI agents. And so the complexity will be managed at, at large by models. And, and, and so looking a bit further ahead, I think that diversification um, yeah. may become um, more, um, I will say, uh, less expensive, to put it that way, more affordable is what I was looking for. But then again, also the uh, the, the new technology and the diversity there will, will require engineers that have a, a bit of a renaissance view on, on this. Um, so it's not necessarily going to be picked up really, really fast. We will need the models and we will need the, 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 over, the oversight and, and, and the um, you know, to manage the complexity, but yes, diversification does come in. And again, building it on, on the earlier comment that workloads, which are in AI becoming so diverse, it's not all large language models. It's, it's going to be indeed going to the edge. And at the edge, you have less resources. You have different types of resources coming in. So you'll need to be you know, able to make trustworthy decisions at that, at that part. So a lot of that will be diversified. It has to be because otherwise you're, you're going to burn your hands in, in you know, trying to do edge-related AI. Uh, on the on the stand. So in that sense, yes, is a short answer, uh, <laughs> and it's you know we need conference like this and many more to to go to the details. I think uh, with everything that's happening and, and changing in the industry today, what advice would you offer a young engineer about where the field is heading, how now, and how to prepare for it? Yeah, and it's it's a uh, it's a great question because we need to give them answers because we need first of all the bright young people to come into the play. Uh, if you look at the, uh, first of all, the inspiration that they should get out of uh, a lot of what's been said here, it changes the way we do healthcare. It changes the way we do mobility. It, it looks at how to sustain the planet. So semiconductor in the, and, and of course its applications and the fan out of it in, um, in algorithms and software are going to be essential to keep the planet alive, basically, but also keep, you know, patients alive. And so that whole span in between should, I hope, indeed, inspire the youngsters to come on board. Uh, I was inspired 40 years ago just by the sheer, uh, you know, interest or curiosity on solid state physics, but that's harder to sell today. Right. <laughs> um, but then again, you know, understanding the fundamentals is such a rich thing. I mean, if, if you're today, maybe a lot of things are superficial, but if you start diving into the, 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 the nature and the chemistry of physics and, and see the applications and the what algorithms can do, I mean, it, it is a world that opens up. So I hope indeed that youngsters are going to be inspired. And of course, being a medical doctor helps patients, but being an engineer maybe helps them more. This has been meeting with Joe Debeck. This has been a fascinating conference. I look forward to the rest of it this afternoon, and uh, I appreciate your time. Sure, thank you. Awesome.